Hi, Misha here, and over on the main Michiko channel, I published a video examining the 1994 through 2004 federal assault weapons ban, part of the crime bill. And in that video, I tried to be as factual and objective as possible. Maybe I succeeded, maybe I failed. In it, I also said I would probably do a black box expanding upon the topic and maybe getting a little more personal. So I try to do what I say I'll do. And here you have it. But full disclosure, I'm tired. It's been a long day. So we'll see how this goes. So I've already given my rundown of the assault weapons ban and kind of the history of gun legislation in, in bullet board form already. What do I think? What are my suggestions? You know, what's my more opinion-oriented analysis of uh, what's going on? Well, I'll give it to you. I don't know how right or wrong I'll be, even if I'll agree tomorrow. This is very much off the cuff brainstorming. I don't tend to form opinions and ideas quickly. Rather, I tend to absorb information and my position kind of gets confirmed, crystallizes, or even changes over time. It's a slow process for me to kind of really figure out where exactly I am because at the end of the day, I really want to base on truth as much as humanly and practically possible and less on just knee-jerk reactions. So we'll see where this goes. So renewing or having a new assault weapons ban is something that's been bandied about now and in the past. We, we talked about that in the main video, so I don't really want to rehash it here and now. Another thing you hear, universal background checks. Okay, I'm not sure how many people realize what we do and don't have when it comes to background checks. Ever since, well, quite, quite a long time actually, the last several years, any firearm purchased from a licensed dealer in FFL does have to go through a background check. The buyer fills out a form called a 4473 and then they're called into the NICS system, N-I-C-S, or it's done all over the internet now because, you know, we live in 2022. Either way, there's an, a check system with the service essentially hosted by the FBI. This is to make sure there are no felonies, warrants, yada yada. And there's certain misdemeanors that prohibit as well. If a person comes back clean, and if they fill out the 4473 properly, answering correctly to the questions, that's pretty much it. If not, they cannot leave with that firearm if they're declined. Things that will decline you, again, mostly felonies or warrants for your arrest, but also misdemeanors if they relate to, like, domestic violence, sexual crimes, that kind of thing. You know, the more egregious end of misdemeanors. And sometimes you can also just be delayed. If your name and social are very close to someone else that does have a record, they usually delay it and take a few days to, to check it just to make sure. Ironically, my brother who was a police officer, always got delayed because, yeah, <clears throat> speaking of, in the past, long ago, police officers were exempt. They could just show their ID. This was changed many moons ago. I frankly forget when. So, yeah, any gun, if it's a new or used, if it goes through a dealer, you've got to do this. If you don't, it is a major penalty for the dealer up to and including jail time and fines if they violate it. This also includes firearms sold by dealers at gun shows. 
Now, in some states, like California, private party transfers are not allowed. Basically, all transfers have to go through a dealer, even if uh, so you want to give a gun to your brother. In other parts of the country, if a gun is privately owned, it can be legally sold between private individuals if it's in private hands. So that's kind of the area that some would like to see improved upon so that there's a, a tracking of, uh, of all that. So that's the idea of universal background checks. Another aspect, and kind of related, guns should not be sold to criminals. I think this is something most people would agree on. And by the rules that have been in place for a very long time, again, if you have a felony, you are not allowed to own a firearm. Not for six months or six years, for the rest of your life. So if a felon gets their hands on a gun, they are committing yet another felony. I know this because one of my best friends that I went to school with through youthful silliness ended up with a felony. So that means that I always had to be very careful not to have firearms around him. Something we both took very seriously. Me as a firearms owner, I felt it was on me and yeah, yada yada. So it's very much illegal. Something I just thought, I, I'm sure most of you already know that, but just in case, um, there you go. Some other suggestions are a gun confiscation or a gun buyback. Right or wrong, constitutional rights, all of that aside, because it really doesn't matter, there are far too many guns in this country. Well over 100 million, maybe as many as 400 million. That's too many to do either with. The government, can you imagine the funding if they did a buyback? It would be multiple billion dollars in taxpayer money, maybe even a trillion, all said and done. And on top of that, you know what happens in those situations? The guns get warehoused, and then warehouses get broken into, and they actually get stolen. A lot of those guns, somewhere between point A and point Z, go missing. The majority probably do make it to the smelter, but who's to say if a handful walk away? Unfortunately, that's what happens. And, you know, a confiscation. People point to New Zealand and Australia. Australia had 600,000 guns. New Zealand, about half that, even less. And, frankly, that's just easier to do. They're island nations, rather smaller. I'm not even talking about personal opinions here. I'm just talking about, logistically, that genie is out of the bottle. We can no more put it back in than we can, say, nuclear power or, or nuclear bombs. Some things, once done, cannot be undone. And so just getting rid of guns is not possible. Think of the completely pointless wars on drugs that we've had in this country. I mean, yeah, in, in, in theory, getting rid of street drugs sounds great to a lot of people. How effective has it been? It didn't work. And this would be even worse. And just like with drugs and prohibition in the 1920s, essentially you would be making otherwise law-abiding citizens criminals. That is not, it's just, it's just not something that's going to work. So that's not even something to really think about because it's, that, that's barking up the wrong tree. Flipping over, one of the kind of main Republican talking points in recent years has been mental health. And I think we can pretty much all agree that someone willing to kill strangers is not mentally sound. Unfortunately, 
when they say this, it's not followed up with, and we need to reform the mental health system with honest legislation behind it. It's simply mental health, shrug, what are you going to do? So it, it, while it has a good base, I mean, I think most people would agree the mental health system in America, in general, guns aside, sucks. And there's a stigma about being unwell in the mentals that there shouldn't be. But it's just a catchphrase. It doesn't mean anything. And um, it's not that the Republicans do it. The Democrats certainly do this, too. I mean, both sides do. Every time there's a, a tragedy, a shooting, they both say, we, we pray for you, we'll do anything possible. And then they do nothing and go on about their day and go, go golfing. It's just something to be said. It's just platitudes, frankly. Another suggestion, idea, is that we have armed security in schools, uh, be they volunteer, retired military or police, or professionals. I think this is a horrible idea. Schools today already feel enough like maximum security prison with all the doors and locks and alarms and all this. Children feel more like prisoners than they do academics. Putting armed guards in there is only going to further reinforce this. That's not the way. That's, in some ways, that's kind of bowing to the inevitable. Instead of trying to get to the root of the problem, it's just accepting it and trying to fight fire with fire. Unfortunately, there are too many innocents in the crossfire there. I vehemently do not think this is the way at all. Absolutely do not. And same goes for giving teachers guns. That, no. No, no, no. I, no. There, there has to be, there, there must be something better. It's just, it's something to be said. But that's kind of what we get on both sides. It's the same thing with the assault weapons ban. It's something to be said, even though it's basically cosmetic. It's basically doing something when someone says, we have to do something. Not we have to do the right thing, we have to do something effective, just something. We have to do something. So they do something, even though they know it's worth nothing. It's just to say they did something. If you can't tell, I don't think much about either side's ideas. Universal background checks, along with what they, what they used to call the gun show loophole, that's, that might do a small amount, but very little, frankly. And the cell weapons ban, look, they tried it. At best, the data is inconclusive. It didn't do anything. It's a cosmetic thing. It's banning guns that look scary while ignoring others that don't. For example, while the AR-15 and the AK were hit pretty heavy with it, it, it directly exempted the Ruger Mini-14. Why? Because it looked sporting. But in reality, just like the AR, it's 223, magazine fed 20 or 30 rounds, and there are plenty of Ruger Mini 14s with other features, but functionally, it's just as potentially lethal. And that's what it did. It, it went for the, how things look. It was a very surface level thing. I was talking with a friend before doing this black box, and he asked me what was the first mass shooting I remember. And um, I had I thought about it. I, was, I thought, yeah, it's Stockton, probably, 1989. I remember hearing 
about the Reagan attempted assassination, but that was a kind of a different event, and I was little too I was too young when it actually happened to know. Although a few years later, I heard about. It. But Stockton, I, I remember that was done with the Chinese AK. And uh, of course, a decade later, you had Columbine, which was done with the Tech Nine. Something I don't talk about much. I was there during a shooting at my university in uh, 2000. And uh, I was not in the room, but I was there in the, in the building area and uh, basically fled next door to my dorm and uh, everything got locked down at that juncture. Again, something I don't, uh, don't talk about and frankly don't think about much. I believe four people or six died. Anyway, he pointed out though, and he was born in the late 50s, the first ones he remembered were from the 60s and that they were done with military surplus bolt actions, cheap bolt actions. You know, obviously the uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, but also you had the various, uh, you know, the, the clock tower sniper and all that stuff. And it's interesting. Now, why bolt actions then? Because that's what was available. That was the tool available and the criminals may do with it. Today, well, a bolt action is probably more expensive than most of your ARs. ARs are among the cheapest guns in gun shops. There's always going to be one gun that's the cheapest. That plus, you know, publicity and all that. That's why ARs end up more common today than they were even in 94, 2004, because there are so many of them out there now. I could go on and on about friends that use them for target shooting and all that, but that's kind of beating a dead horse, and again, I'm tired. But I thought that was interesting that he brought up the point that when he was a kid, a couple of the big shooting events were actually done with old bolt actions. And then, of course, in the 70s, when it was more, you know, gangland criminals, inner city criminals, there were the so-called Saturday Night Specials, little pocket guns. And actually, handguns today are still used in the majority of crimes, uh, along with some shotguns. Rifles, in general, are less common. A lot to do with just their, their overall size. <sighs> I hate talking about this stuff, guys. <sighs> because, on the one hand, I sincerely deplore suffering and needless death and violence. It seems counterproductive to me. And I very much believe in the, the right that everyone should have a chance at life. On the other hand, as I've said before, Firearms have been a very positive thing in my own personal life and the lives of a lot of my friends. They've actually, you know, getting into them, got a few friends kind of off drugs or at the very least kind of to quit drinking. Because if you want to be a legal firearms owner, you cannot have a criminal record. And it's a good thing to socialize. I, again, I've talked about this before. Like anything else, it's inanimate. There's the, you know, some people say guns kill people. People say people kill people, not guns. You know, the two are working together. But a human can kill another human with bare hands. A gun without a human operating it isn't going to do much. I've even had them fall on my head, you know, from a shelf. That hurts. Not exactly lethal. I recognize that having access to guns can make something easier but people that are that mentally deranged can be very creative and determined just look at any anyone in prisons and in an area where they should have no weapons at all 
they managed to make some pretty ornate weapons there. The fact is, again, guns are here. That's just something we have to deal with. I don't see any purpose in banning them based on how they look. Again, both actions can be used as well. Different tactics, sure, but that's not the way. Uh, we already have a lot of rules and regulations on the purchasing of guns. I know the narrative is that anyone can go buy a gun. And to some extent that's true, and to some extent it's not. Anyone with a clean, clean record can. But they have to go through a background check and all that. Now you can say, well, that shouldn't be. What if they are plants? The thing is, we also live in a country where people are innocent until proven guilty. You can't do future crimes. You can't do like minority report here. And we wouldn't want to. And there's, of course, the red flag laws, which to some seem very reasonable. Unfortunately, I'm not sure I trust people in locations not to abuse them. Honestly, especially against minorities. African Americans, Hispanics. What if you had a corrupt white police force that would act on those regs to disarm all the minorities in the area? Just saying. Uh, it's one of those things. To, no. Uh, Maybe there's something there that could be worked on, but as they're, as they're stated now, it's too easy to be abused by people with malice just to harass someone. Call me cynical, but hey, we live in a world of internet trolls and people being swatted and stuff. I give them red flag laws and they'll just integrate that into swatting. And once the guns are taken away, when will they get back? And where will they be? Again, guns go missing from police evidence rooms all the time. <sighs> I don't know, guys. So what's my solution? You know what my solution is? I don't fucking have one. I don't fucking know. And that's okay. It's not my job to know. I'm not paid to do it. I am interested because on the one hand, firearms are important in my life. On the other hand, I don't want my fucking fellow citizens to be living in fear or dying. So yeah, I'm invested. But I don't have the level of hubris to say I know the answer. You know who does though? Government. State or federal, congressmen, governors, these are the people that get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a, a year. They need to earn that. Is there an easy solution? No. No, there is not. I think people, that's what they want. They want an easy solution to ban all the guns. Or the guns are innocent. Um, it's all mental health. What can we do about it? Nothing. You know, people are always going to die. No, that, I, don't, I don't accept that either. I don't accept either. It's going to be a hard solution to find and it's going to require a lot of work compromise study and sincere not political rhetoric dialogue and that's what people in congress today don't want to do they don't want to work they want to just stand by their platform by their rhetoric get their five minutes on MSNBC or Fox or 15 seconds on Facebook or Twitter. Get that notoriety. Get that re-election. That's what's important, right? Getting them re-elections. And that's what it's boiled down to. And that's what does make me mad. Because they care more about their job than lives. Oh, sure, they say, we'll do anything possible. We're praying for you. Fuck off. You know, the first time maybe, but by this point, 
sit down. You know what? Get the main people on both sides together. Do a big photo op on the steps of the Capitol. Have them say, look, we're on opposite sides, but we can all agree something has to be done. We're going to set aside our partisan differences. We're going to put our noses to the grindstone. We're going to be Americans first, not Republicans, not Democrats. And we're going to do our best. We're going to look into this. We're going to set partisan politics aside for this one time. That's what Americans did in World War II and other major crisis times. It's not easy. And they may lose some votes on both sides. But sometimes it's just the right thing to do. And I'm not saying even then there's going to be a perfect solution. Rarely in life is there ever a perfect solution. But try. Instead of being concerned about your own careers and jobs, do your job, put your country first. Like thousands and thousands of military, police, hospital workers, firefighters have been doing all this time. Do it too. You get paid the big bucks. You have dozens, hundreds of staffers that can conduct research. Figure out why this is happening. If there's any common threads, if there's any things that can be done, try. Don't just fall back on tired cliches like assault weapons bans. Try something new. And try working with the adversary. Because I think that's also a major part of this. This country is divided. We know that. Tensions are high. People are scared. People are angry. They're afraid. And you've got these young kids now. Two of the most recent shooters, 18 years old. They've grown up in a post-9-11 world. You know what? If they're hopeless and fatalistic, I can't fucking blame them. What hope have they seen? They had controversial president after controversial president in their life, two major wars, an epidemic. They had an election that people aren't sure about. Can you blame them for being just like not even believing in a future? It's hard enough being a kid. It's even harder being a young adult, 18, 20. Instead of helping and trying to quell fears and reassure that there's a future, politicians and the media are fueling the fire. This is the dividend. We're starting to reap what we've sown for the past years. You start, you know, for years there's been toxicity and fighting and name calling and, and no one sitting down to just have a beer and go, you know what, you're a Democrat, but you ain't half bad. Or, you know, you're not too stupid for a Republican. You know, you, whatever. That's what it used to be in my, home, my hometown. Yeah, there was kind of gentle ribbing about, uh, along party lines. But you could still sit down, have a meal, have a drink, and kind of let it fall by the wayside. Or at the very least, have a respectful enough disagreement. And that's really what I miss in politics today. The lack of respect is deplorable on both sides. Now, I understand that those are the extremists on both parties. The more center people... Yeah, but at best, those people get overlooked. And at worst, they get mocked and ridiculed for not being extremists. Democracies do best and thrive more or less center. They have never done well and will never do well on either extreme, left or right. That's not how a democracy works because this isn't a nation for one group. It's all of us. So there. That's, my solution is we pay people the big bucks 
do your jobs. I bet you anything else. Look at all the great things we've done. We found a cure, well not cure, we found a vaccine for COVID in record time. Yes, thanks in part to Trump and many, many others, Fauci, scientists in Germany. We build billion dollar aircraft carriers that are technological marvels. We have jets that can go through the sky at over twice the speed of sound and not be detected by radar. We've been putting people in orbit of our planet for decades. And you tell me there's nothing we can do to save a few lives? This is just hopeless that the extremes are either eh, nothing we can do about it or take all the guns. I don't believe it. There's got to be something, our series of some things we can do that make students feel safer, that help those before they can commit these crimes, while at the same time not infringing upon the rights and enjoyment of millions of law-abiding gun owners in this country. Because we're not a bad group of people. And I do get tired of being lumped in because there's a few crazies, just as the left would, you know, with BLM and stuff. People will pick the few rabble-rousers and try to paint the entire African American, uh, uh, excuse me, African American community. Like, no, extremists are outliers. They're not representative of any, of any community. Stop doing that. Stop cherry picking the craziest people in a group you don't like to try to villainize that group. We're all just people. And a lot of us like me do not want people dead. And it hurts us. And I don't think the solution is on one side. I don't think the Republicans can come up with the solution or the Democrats. I think this is a bipartisan thing. Because certainly mental health is a component. But we also have to get serious about it. And that very well bleeds over into socialized medicine and health care, which we do not have. The cost of health care has gotten insane. But that's a story for another day. On the other hand, the Democrats have got to stop trotting out the same old failed stuff. It didn't work in 94. It hasn't been working in California and New York. Why would it work federally? It wouldn't. It's just a political talking point at that. I'm tired. Anyway, guys, I'll let you go. Have some rest. If you get the feeling we all just need something good to happen, not individually, like to us as a people, a species even, we've been kicked in the teeth for going on three years now, one thing after another. Feels like the universe owes us something positive like we discover the cure to cancer or something I, I don't know just something universally good that we can all rally around kind of like the moon landing in 69 i know that people argue about the finances but you know, for that moment in july of that year mankind had an achievement it could be proud of i miss that I miss optimism. And you know what? I'm not going to give up on it. Because if you can't envision something better, you definitely won't make it happen. And sometimes this stuff has to come through willpower. Perseverance. This is what got America through the Great Depression and World War II. No, there weren't easy answers then, and there aren't easy answers now. Just because they're not 
readily apparent and simple doesn't mean they're not out there. I think we can find answers to not just this question, but many others. We have an economy teetering on the edge. We've got fuel prices that are crazy high. We need to quit dicking around with silly political stump speeches and talking points and start rolling up our sleeves and dealing with real issues so that this country and this world can sustain itself into the future. We have to survive. And somehow we will. Paying those guys the big bucks. I say we just withhold their paychecks until they come up with a solution. But if we did that, it'd come real quick. Anyway, folks, I appreciate you hanging out with me. It's been a hell of a time lately. This is Misha, and I wish you all a good Memorial Day weekend.